Hello everyone, my name is Natalie of Alternative Belgium's History Channel and today I want to talk to you about the Belgian royal family or the history of the Belgian monarchy. In later videos I will go into much more detail about the different kings, the different monarchs, but for now I wanted to give you kind of a brief history and I think it's not going to be that brief of the royal family, the history of the royal family, the history of the Belgian monarchy. It's actually a much more interesting story than you would be expecting because there's plenty of scandals, of drama, of tragedy, etc. In my opinion, Netflix could definitely make another The Crown series, but then based on the lives, on the history of the Belgian royal family. First and for all, what is Belgium? Apparently that is a very important question because it is the most asked question about Belgium on Google. So what is Belgium? Belgium is a constitutional parliamentary monarchy. So what does it mean? A monarchy, of course, we have a monarch, we have a king as the head of state, but it's constitutional, which means that that monarch is dependent, is restricted by the constitution. Basically, in real life nowadays, that means that the king does not really have any, does not have any political power, does not have any, any real governing power. That does not mean that he and the other working royals of the royal family just lay around all day, spend the, the money of the taxpayers. No, they actually do have a role to play. They do have work to do. And their main job is in PR, Belgium's PR. Belgium's public relations, they are important for marketing our country, they're important for the image building. They go on trade missions, uh, they go on state visits, they receive important people, so they do have an important uh, role to play. Specifically for the king, King Philip, uh, our current king, is that uh, he has a very important job, very tough job, by the way. Um, I think it's one of the toughest jobs in Belgium at the moment. He has a mediating function. So he has to kind of unify the country. Uh, he has to bring together the different regions, the different political parties, especially after the federal elections and encourage them and help them, support them to form one federal government very difficult to do by the way because we have a double world record of days without a government now the best example of this lack of real power of real governing power of the monarch is the royal crisis of 1990. now the monarch as i mentioned before the monarch does not have any real power however he does have to sign new laws before they come into power so that actually at first seems like he does have power right so it's just appearances because the king cannot really refuse. One king tried, King Baudouin, Baldwin or Baudouin, depending on which language you prefer. He refused to sign the abor abortion law of 1990 himself. So the government dethroned or decrowned him for one day. They signed the law themselves, the government, and then made him king again the next day. Now nobody knew about this. So the day without a king, everybody Everybody, meaning the common people, of course, the government knew about it, but everybody else in the country just found out the day after. My favorite story about the Belgian monarchy is the first story is how it started, how it came to be. Because don't forget that Belgium as a country has only existed since 1830. Before that, it never had its own king or queen. So when a special council was discussing which form this new country should, should have, it surprisingly decided to become a monarchy. Monarchy, surprising, why? Well, this is the 19th century already, so most other countries were getting rid of their monarchies, were getting rid of their royals. So why a monarchy? Now, this council wanted to avoid the chaos of revolution after revolution after revolution, the social unrest, as in, as in France, our neighbors. So a monarchy seemed more stable to them. Of course, not just a monarchy, but a constitutional parliamentary monarchy. So not an absolutist monarchy as was often the case before. Uh, this monarchy would have a constitution that was actually very progressive, even the most progressive at the time in Europe. But there was one problem, of course, you have a monarchy and there's one thing that you really need for a monarchy and that is a monarch, a king. 
And as so often in history, Belgium wasn't really allowed to choose by itself. So its powerful neighbors, they had to agree with it. And at the time, that was mainly the UK and what is now Germany. So the first candidate was actually the son of the French king. And of course, that received a very clear and very quick no. Everyone was still wary, was still very wary and kind of scared of the French only 15 years after Waterloo, after Napoleon. In the end, they did identify what seemed to be the perfect candidate. His name was Leopold von Saxon Coburg and Gotha. He was a German-born British prince, so perfect, basically. And he said, yes. Leopold I was crowned on the 21st of July, 1831, as the first king of Belgians. The 21st of July is still Belgium's national holiday. It's kind of our 4th of July. It's kind of our Quatre uh, Juillet in France. But he had a very hard job to do, to build a nation out of this new country, which had always been occupied and part of larger political constructions. Leopold I, he was actually the uncle of Queen Victoria of England. You know that all monarchies in Europe are kind of related. Um, Queen Victoria even referred to him as her second father and even her only father because her own father had died. Now many books have been written about the next king, his son and successor Leopold II, who became the second king of Belgians in 1865 and none of these books were positive about him. Even during his reign he was not loved and not even in Belgium, even though if you think about it and if you look at it objectively, his main aim in life seemed to be to make Belgium great. But it was just too great for Belgians. He had very big plans. Most people would call them megalomaniac and his plans were definitely too big for Belgium. He often said that he was born in the wrong country. Belgium was too small, was not ambitious enough for someone like him. One of his plans for Belgium was for it to become a colonial power, just like the other great nations of Europe, of course. But there was no interest from the government. There was no interest from the people either. So he just decided to go for it himself. He became the founder and the sole owner, colonial owner, of an immense area in the heart of Africa, which he named the Free State of Congo. It was anything but free. His administration was characterized by brutal exploitations of locals and of course of the local natural resources, which made him very rich. He used that money to fund his megalomaniac projects, building projects mainly, in Belgium. And for that reason, he is also popularly known as the Builder King. He was really set and he was really focused on making Brussels a great European capital, like Paris, like London, with among others the building projects of the Justice Palace, or the Court of Brussels, the largest 19th century building, uh, the Basilica of the Sacred Heart, which is the sixth largest church in the world, the saint Cantonaire Park, all very impressive, but megalomaniac. I'll definitely make another video just about Leopold II. Leopold II did not have a surviving son, so his nephew Albert was the one to succeed him as King Albert I in 1909. His reputation and his legacy could not be more different than his predecessor. His nickname was the Soldier King because of his brave leadership as the Belgian army commander during the First World War. He was the highest ranking commander on the front line of all armies. It is said that he was never targeted by the Germans because even they respected him for that. Also, he was the cousin of the German emperor as well. He unfortunately died in a rock climbing accident in 1934, but at least he did not have to go through another world war. That was reserved for his son Leopold III, who was king and army commander during the German invasion and occupation of Belgium. As it became quickly clear that the Germans would completely overrun Belgium, the Belgian government went into exile. The king did not want to go with them, and he stayed with his troops in Belgium. As I mentioned before, the king cannot really make any important decisions by himself, and he definitely did not have the power to surrender the country to the Germans, which he did do on the 27th of May 1940. He remained in Brussels as a prisoner until the Germans deported him to Germany in 1944. After the war, there was a lot of resistance against his return. His capitulation in 1940 was considered unconstitutional or even treason by some. 
It took another five years of political bickering for Leopold to abdicate in favor of his 20-year-old son, Baudouin. I would describe King Baldwin, King Baudouin, uh, King Baudouin as our Queen Elizabeth. They both came to power around the same time. He was very loved. Um, there were not too many scandals about, about him around his own person. Very religious, conservative. And he had a long reign of more than 40 years. I know, that's not even close to Queen Elizabeth, but of course she was a special case. I was 10 years old when he passed away and I actually remember that I was watching a, a cartoon, a children's program on TV and breaking news, King Baudouin has died. So I actually remember that I felt sad about that. You know, it's somebody, it's a person that you grew up with in a way. So King Baudouin and Queen Fabiola, his wife, did not have any children of their own. So now there were two options or the brother of King Baudouin, Albert, or his son, or the nephew of King Baudouin, King Philip then. Many were in favor of skipping Albert and immediately go to the younger king, Philip, who was already being trained by his uncle Baudouin to be his successor. It's just that Baudouin died earlier, I guess, than they had expected. But in the end, they decided to go for a transitional king and to go with the father. Albert II. Albert II is probably best known for the whole saga of an illegitimate daughter, which I'm really not going to go into that today or ever, probably. Albert abdicated in 2013 in favor of his son, and this is the current King Philip I. King Philip has surprised most Belgians. Not a lot was expected from him. He was seen as a bit stiff, grey, boring figure, but most agree that he's actually not doing bad at all. Contrary to his own father, he has shown himself as a family man, a warm father, uh, a lot more approachable than any of his predecessors. His popular wife, Mathilde, who's now also considered a fashion icon in royal circles, has certainly helped with his positive image. And maybe the best is yet to come for the Belgian monarchy because we might finally have our first queen in a few decades at least. Princess Elizabeth is now just 21 years old, but she's already very much loved by the Belgians. She's very down to earth, she can adapt to different occasions, she has completed her military training without special treatment, and is now studying international politics at Oxford. She'll be the first monarch to be completely bilingual Dutch, French, as well as speak very fluently English and German. With the prospects of having our own Queen Elizabeth, the future of the Belgian monarchy is actually brighter than it has been in a very long time. Of course, the Belgian royal family has never been as famous or, or as popular as the British royal family is and has been, and there have been quite some appeals to its abolition, but that is really not likely to happen any day soon. In the next few videos, we'll go and see some of the places that are linked to the Belgian royal family, the Belgian monarchy. If you want to stay updated on these, please hit the subscribe button.